becomes part of the bank's reserves, just as all deposits do. And regarding reserve requirements, as stated in Modern Money Mechanics, a bank must maintain legally required reserves equal to a prescribed percentage of its deposits. It then quantifies this by stating, under current regulations, the reserve requirement against most transaction accounts is 10%. This means that with a ten billion dollar deposit, ten percent or one billion is held as the required reserve while the other nine billion is considered an excessive reserve and can be used as the basis for new loans. Now it is logical to assume that this nine billion is literally coming out of the existing ten billion dollar deposit. However, this is actually not the case. What really happens is that the nine billion is simply created out of thin air on top of the existing ten billion dollar deposit. This is how the money supply is expanded. As stated in Modern Money Mechanics, of course they, the banks, do not really pay out loans from the money they receive as deposits. If they did this, no additional money would be created. What they do when they make loans is to accept promissory notes, loan contracts, in exchange for credits, money, to the borrower's transaction accounts. In other words, the nine billion can be created out of nothing simply because there is a demand for such a loan and that there is a ten billion dollar deposit to satisfy the reserve requirements. Now, let's assume that somebody walks into this bank and borrows the newly available nine billion dollars. They will then most likely take that money and deposit it into their own bank account. The process then repeats, for that deposit becomes part of the bank's reserves. 10% is isolated and in turn 90% of the 9 billion or 8.1 billion is now available as newly created money for more loans. And of course that 8.1 can be loaned out and redeposited creating an additional 7.2 billion to 6.5 billion to 5.9 billion etc. This deposit money creation loan cycle can technically go on to infinity. The average mathematical result is that about 90 billion dollars can be created on top of the original 10 billion. In other words, for every deposit that ever occurs in the banking system, about nine times that amount can be created out of thin air. Money jitters, ask the obliging Bank of America for a jar of soothing instant money, M-O-N-E-Y, in the form of a convenient personal loan. So, now that we understand how money is created by this fractional reserve banking system, a logical yet elusive question might come to mind. What is actually giving this newly created money value? The answer? The money that already exists. The new money essentially steals value from the existing money supply. For the total pool of money is being increased irrespective to demand for goods and services. And as supply and demand finds equilibrium, prices rise, diminishing the purchasing power of each individual dollar. This is generally referred to as inflation, and inflation is essentially a hidden tax on the public. What is the advice that you generally get, and that is inflate the currency? They don't say debase the currency. They don't say devalue the currency. They don't say cheat the people who are saved. They say lower the interest rates. The real deception is when we distort the value of money. When we create money out of thin air, we have no savings, and yet there's so-called capital. So my question boils down to this. How in the world can we expect to solve the problems of inflation, that is, the increase in the supply of money, with more inflation? Of course, it can't. The fractional reserve system of monetary expansion is inherently inflationary. For the act of expanding the money supply without there being a proportional expansion of goods and services in the economy will always debase a currency. In fact, a quick glance at the historical values of the US dollar versus the money supply reflects this point definitively, for the inverse relationship is obvious. One dollar in 1913 required $21.60 in 2007 to match value. That is a 96% devaluation since the Federal Reserve came into existence. Now, if this reality of inherent and perpetual inflation seems absurd and economically self-defeating, hold that thought 
for absurdity is an understatement in regard to how our financial system really operates. For in our financial system, money is debt. And debt is money. Here is a chart of the U.S. money supply from 1950 to 2006. Here is a chart of the U.S. national debt for the same period. How interesting it is that the trends are virtually the same. For the more money there is, the more debt there is. The more debt there is, the more money there is. To put it a different way, every single dollar in your wallet is owed to somebody by somebody. For remember, the only way the money can come into existence is from loans. Therefore, if everyone in the country were able to pay off all debts, including the government, there would not be one dollar in circulation. In fact, the last time in American history the national debt was completely paid off was in 1835 after President Andrew Jackson shut down the central bank that preceded the Federal Reserve. In fact, Jackson's entire political platform essentially revolved around his commitment to shut down the central bank, stating at one point, the bold efforts the present bank has made to control the government are but premonitions of the fate that awaits the American people should they be deluded into a perpetuation of this institution or the establishment of another like it. Unfortunately, his message was short-lived, and the international bankers succeeded to install another central bank in 1913 the Federal Reserve. And as long as this institution exists, perpetual debt is guaranteed. Now, so far we have discussed the reality that money is created out of debt through loans. These loans are based on a bank's reserves and reserves are derived from deposits. And through this fractional reserve system, any one deposit can create nine times its original value, in turn debasing the existing money supply raising prices in society. And since all this money is created out of debt and circulated randomly through commerce, people become detached from their original debt and a disequilibrium exists where people are forced to compete for labor in order to pull enough money out of the money supply to cover their costs of living. As dysfunctional and backwards as all of this might seem, there is still one thing we have omitted from this equation and it is this element of the structure which reveals the truly fraudulent nature of the system itself the application of interest when the government borrows money from the fed or when a person borrows money from a bank it almost always has to be paid back with accrued interest in other words almost every single dollar that exists must be eventually returned to a bank with interest paid as well but, if all money is borrowed from the central bank and is expanded by commercial banks through loans, only what would be referred to as the principal is being created in the money supply. So then, where is the money to cover all of the interest that is charged? Nowhere. It doesn't exist. The ramifications of this are staggering, for the amount of money owed back to the banks will always exceed the amount of money that is available in circulation. This is why inflation is a constant in the economy, for new money is always needed to help cover the perpetual deficit built into the system, caused by the need to pay the interest. What this also means is that mathematically, defaults and bankruptcy are literally built into the system and there will always be poor pockets of society that get the short end of the stick. An analogy would be a game of musical chairs, for once the music stops, somebody is left out to dry. And that's the point. It invariably transfers true wealth from the individual to the banks. For if you are unable to pay for your mortgage, they will take your property. This is particularly enraging when you realize that not only is such a default inevitable due to the fractional reserve practice, but also because of the fact that the money that the bank loaned to you didn't even legally exist in the first place. In 1969, there was a Minnesota court case involving a man named Jerome Daly, who was challenging the foreclosure of his home.